Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey everyone, you're listening to Item 13, a bi-weekly podcast covering everything African food, and I'm your host, Yom Tego. Every other week, we'll delve into the world of African food, chefs, curators, and bloggers. I hope you enjoy it. This week's episode features Omer Eltigani, a Sudanese cook and author based in the UK and currently working on Sudan's first cookbook. Previously a hospital pharmacist, Omer felt a lack of representation in Sudanese food online, and in the UK, so he wanted to do something about it through his blog and cookbook. He hopes to use food as a learning tool to broaden people's horizons about Sudan, which is often associated with negative press. I learned a lot about Sudanese food and culture through our interview, and I hope you do too. Here's the show. So welcome to Item 13, Omer. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is great. I've been I've been following you online. I watch your CNN special, so it's great that Excellent. you agreed to be on here. I'm excited to learn about Sudanese food, which I don't know a lot about, so this should be very interesting, I think. And then and also just learn about your personal background and sort of how you got into to this space. Sure, um, sure. So let's first start about um, you. What, who is Omer? Where did you grow up? And sort of, um, could you tell us, you know, your first earliest memories you can remember sure, of growing up sure, in, in sure. Sudan? Uh, so I was brought up in Sudan. Uh, however, I wasn't actually born there. I was actually born in, in Dublin, in Ireland. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually born there on the 17th of March, which is uh, St. Patrick's Day as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, born in Ireland on uh, St. Patrick's Day, okay. <laughs> yes, actually, so a funny start to life, and yeah. then I moved to uh, Khartoum, we, my family moved there, okay. and then I lived in Khartoum for about five or six years, and kind of had my, my early years there, yeah. essentially, uh, just with family kind of growing up, settling in, and then around the same time, Sudan was kind of going through some difficulties, and a lot of people were leaving Sudan. So when I got to the age of five uh, or six-ish, my parents took myself and my two brothers and we moved to the UK. Um, and I've been here since. So I've been living in the UK since about the age of five or six. Okay, cool. Do you have any memory? I don't know how many of us remember, you know, stuff from when we were five or six, but do you have any memories? Yeah, of- yeah, 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 I do. I do. I, I've got a lot of memories of, um, of just kind of, being a kid there, like playing in the garden, like being around family, and they're, they're all really good memories. So, I mean, maybe it's just that kind of childhood innocence of right. not realizing the, stru- <laughs> the destructive nature of what's right. happening around mm-hmm. you, but we were having quite quite pleasant lives. And as I said, we were always with each other, uh, always with family. And I, I remember having the feeling that we never really had like one home. We had like multiple homes, like my cousin's home was equally my home as, as their home yeah. and like 
a grandparent's house is, you know, it, it's just exactly the same thing. So uh, always being with each other and always this kind of fluidity of our spaces and always being kind of together. And it was the opposite when we moved to the UK. <laughs> I came here, um, you know, my family you know, moved into a little house and, you know, there was no extended family. No one came over. There wasn't this movement, this activity as, as kind of Africans have with right. each other. Yeah, um, that is so That is so interesting in, in a lot of ways because I think, fortunately, unfortunately, I, I think that as Africans, we don't even know that much about, um, you know, other parts. You know, if you're from West Africa, you don't know as much about East or North or Southern Africa. But these right. common threads of like food and family and how we connect with each other, just like your description of growing up sounds almost exactly like mine where you have cousins coming yeah. in and out and there isn't really um yeah defined spaces oh, exactly right spaces. yeah absolutely so yeah it's nice that that translates right. over the whole continent mm-hmm. and so then you move to the uk and you talked about okay so now you're sort of a little bit more isolated if you will do you have any yeah. sort of memories of of food in particular since we're going to start heading in that direction of, yeah, you know, of course, did your yeah. family um, continue to cook Sudanese food? Like, where did they find the yeah. ingredients and all of that stuff to, to make it still feel a little bit like home, I guess? Of course. So I guess when we moved away from Sudan, uh, there was obviously this kind of foundation in my memories about Sudanese foods, and we, I never really tried anything outside of that realm, you know, the odd pizza and whatever here and there. And then, um, yeah, we came to the UK, and my mom's a, like a Sudanese purist, so she only cooks Sudanese food. <laughs> She doesn't cook anything else. Okay. Um, so she continued that and, and we'd still kind of uh, have Sudanese food on a regular basis. And it was almost like, you know, this connection to, Su- to Sudan, even though we, were, we moved away from it, so, uh, the food that she prepared was our, or at least my connection to, to Sudan mm-hmm. again, which was really nice to have consistently. Obviously, mm-hmm. we were trying other foods at the right, same time. Yeah, you know, we yeah. got introduced to kind of the regular, you know, children's foods of burgers and pizzas and <laughs> French fries and whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I still remember fondly uh, enjoying her foods uh, a lot back then. Good. Yeah. So then how did you sort of, um, how did you personally end up sort of in this world of Sudanese food, right? So especially, and I don't mean to stereotype, but I will take it from like my West African experience. Yes, especially as a Especially as a man, right? I see where you're going with it. Especially as a man. I mean, we all grew up, you know, having uh, our, our moms in particular, grandpa- uh, grandmoms, I should say, also like cooking and we have all these good memories, but it's usually the women or the girls who end up in the kitchen sort of supporting their, their mom, their yeah. aunties, etc. Um, so how did you sort of end up in the space? And I know, I think I read that you used to be a hospital pharmacist too. So then how, you know, how, what was that journey from going to pharmacist and deciding I'm going to go back or go into this cooking thing, <laughs> especially in a cu- cultures like ours where, you know, it's not typical for, for men to, to do so. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a very valid question. And, uh, as you've highlighted, it's, it's exactly the same in Sudanese culture as well. It's usually women that dominate cooking and, and those kind of spaces. Um, and men aren't really involved in those things at all. I guess it happened kind of gradually and I got, I got more and more into it. I was basically, it happened much later when I was at university. So it was the first time I was sort of, you know, providing for myself and mm-hmm. like cooking my own foods at home and stuff like that. And I was making quite basic student foods, you know, just your pastas and your <laughs> yeah. curries or whatever it is. Um, but for me, it wasn't, it wasn't enough or like I, I wasn't really enjoying the foods that I was making. And I guess I was a lot more health conscious. I wanted to be aware of what I was eating, but at the same time, I wanted to have a connection to the food and what happened was I was at university I'd be going home to visit my family like maybe you know every couple of weeks something mm-hmm. like this uh living in Manchester and then visiting visiting them in Birmingham okay. so when I'd be home I'd like collect these like food parcels and I'd bring them back home with me because that was like you know it was a, a lifesaver really yeah. like have my mom's food to take back with me and then I uh you know just wanted to be able to make it myself rather than getting on a train, going yeah. down to a house, and then bringing it back myself. I wanted to just do it myself uh, in Manchester. So she kind of taught me a few things here and there. And I started getting into it and started, you know, enjoying kind of making these foods and also having a connection myself, empowering myself to have that connection. 
And then I realized that there wasn't much exposure of Sudanese food. So then I just decided collecting recipes myself. And at first it was like a personal project, okay. uh, just my own little notes and how yeah. to make these things just for myself. And then my cousins really wanted it. And then my uh, non-Sudanese friends wanted it, my roommates and whoever. Um, and then I realized, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there that want access to this food that don't have access to this food. So that's how I, you know, jumped in, yeah, you know, right. both in and just decided to <laughs> make a cookbook about it. Cool. And so then I guess your first sort of step towards your cookbook project, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is the blog, right? So you started... Yeah. Um, the mm-hmm. Sudanese kitchen blog. So could you tell us a little bit about that? And then you, so you've talked about, you know, collecting um, recipes and all of that stuff, but then blogging is for some people now it's almost a full-time job, right? So how do you sort of get into it, build your audience, continue to um, create recipes and educate people really on, on Sudanese food? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. I was just, um, just harnessing the internet really i mean social media is a kind of a powerful thing so i just took to facebook i took to instagram i tried tweeting i'm not very good at that thing because you, <laughs> you have to be on it all the time um so i just yeah i started posting stuff um but not just food either not just food at all i'd actually be posting about sudanese culture connection that foods have with people and i started really enjoying it to be honest with you taking yeah. photos of either uh, family foods of us, you know, at home, and then just sharing stuff about the culture, like the pyramids or the fashion there, or or anything, like really kind of almost trying to represent Sudan uh, in kind of in, through yeah. social media, really. Yeah. Uh, but also trying to keep um, trying to keep a, a good a good standard of photos. I mean, some of the photos that maybe I'd seen of Sudanese foods aren't the most flattering, right. and the south. <laughs> Not, probably necessarily isn't the most photogenic food, let's say. So um, I just tried to kind of uh, make it as creative and artistic as possible. And, and, I, and yeah, I, people responded I, to that. People... Yeah, and, and to your point about <laughs> food being photogenic, I think that that's sort of a common thread um, with African yeah. food sort of in general. And, and um, I think... When I, I follow, you know, obviously I follow a lot of um, people that blog or cook or chefs, etc. And I th- and I mm. find that with the explosion of Instagram, like making food also look good, <laughs> yeah. is sort of part of the way to you know to sell it or make it appealing to a wider audience. And so absolutely. that sort of is it's, is is a key, yeah. Fast. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so as sort of you've you've grown the blog, um, you've talked. You also mentioned you know you've worked or done collaborations with people in in London I would, or in in the UK I would assume could you talk a little bit more about that and sort of some of the work you've done to support um refugees and charities that you know are close close to your heart sure sure well um yeah I, I guess when I started getting some exposure a lot of you know different organizations got in touch with me uh some of them being refugee charities at the time working with with Sudanese people seeking uh asylum um in the uk and obviously this is at the time back then like 2012 or so Mm -hmm. a bit later maybe um when there was a lot of people in in calais and a lot of people just moving generally into into europe and into the uk um so i just started like working with them we do small little events um just kind of awareness events or even just little fundraisers here and there and just kind of doing what, what we could really Um, But also those events weren't just confined to the UK either. Um, I think at the time that Trump put a ban on seven um, majority Muslim countries, Mm -hmm. Sudan being one of them at the time, uh, from from entering the States, um, there was an an online organization called Roads and Kingdoms uh, based in New York City. And they'd asked me to come and and maybe curate a a menu for them that they would use as a fundraiser. Uh, for for people seeking uh, asylum again in the states as well, so it was nice to kind of collaborate with with these organisations and help out where I right. could. Right, and that's such a great example of like using food to bridge sort of cultures and you know 
and you know uh, what you would call it um mm. creating mm. understanding right uh, yeah, that exactly. we are the same yeah. underlying we're all sort of the same people if you will we all you know like to be we all connected through food through people that we care about and exactly that, and we all have rights you right. know we have exactly. rights uh, to move to be where we want to be yeah. and so I think that it was important for me to support that. That's absolutely uh, fantastic. Um, okay, so usually this is where I'll take a, a short break, and then um, when we come back, we'll dive specifically into the topic of Sudanese cuisine. We'll talk about sort of how you got into that CNN feature, and then your cookbook right. project. Welcome back uh, from the short break. We're now going to sort of delve into what is Sudanese food? Like I, in preparing for this interview, I realized like it hit me that I actually don't even know what Sudanese food is. And when I think of North African food in general, I think the things I think of are probably more Moroccan. So like tagine sure. and, you know, couscous and all of, sort mm-hmm. of the aromatic spices that go with that. Um, so why don't we do that first for our listeners? Sort of what sure. what is Sudanese food? If you could break that down for us. Sure. Well, I think a good way to to kind of summarize it is that Sudan, Sudan itself isn't isn't is a very kind of diverse country. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it does have a lot of foods from North Africa, but then it also has a lot of foods from West Africa as well, and oh. kind of central parts of Africa too. So there's this misconception that maybe Sudanese food is a particular type of food and it's it's one defined thing, mm-hmm. but in reality, it's a whole host of different things because the country is so vast and so large that it really encompasses a lot of kind of North African, even West African, obviously That's East African, and even central parts uh, of Africa as well. So, um, yeah, it just really lends itself to a, a whole host of different things. So, um, yes, there are a lot of um, Middle Eastern North African foods. Mm-hmm. That's had a, a, a very big influence since, I, I guess, the Islamic period. Yeah. Uh, and the majority became majority Muslim, of course. And, and with that kind of cultural impact, uh, a lot of kind of Middle Eastern foods became very commonly known uh, in Sudan. So like things like uh, moussaka or like um, um, different types of rice dishes or salads, things like that. Okay. So a very kind of Middle Eastern um, influence. There's uh, a very common dish called fool, which are, are fava beans. Okay. Uh, yeah, and you get that quite, that's actually quite spread out as well in the Middle East yeah, as well. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I've had, yeah, I've had, I've had those beans before. And then do you, would you typically also have, um, and this is just me being, <laughs> not knowing sure. enough about the soup, but something similar, for example, to like flatbreads, for example, or yeah. um, falafel yeah, yeah. type um there's many different types of bread in Sudan. Uh, there's the, the typical national bread, which is a flat bread. Okay. It's called, called Ejbeledi. It's, like it's like a typical flat bread, really. Um, but then there's also kind of very typical Sudanese uh, breads that you wouldn't really find elsewhere. Okay. So one is, is like a pancake bread called gurrasa. And it's quite similar to the Ethiopian injera, but yeah. it's not made from teff. It's actually made from wheat. Okay. Um, but it is fermented, so you do kind mm-hmm. of get this sourness yeah. to it as well. Then there's another uh, another type of bread, which is a very wafer-thin bread, mm-hmm. very, very thin sheets stacked up on top of each other, and that's called kisra. Okay. Now, that's made from fermented sorghum. Uh-huh. Right? So sorghum is a, a type of flour right. that you're not really going to mm-hmm. see that much of at least in Europe and North America. Yeah, not in, exactly, right? So mostly in, in actually, yeah, in Africa. Yeah, More definitely. So, than, definitely. so where do you find, not to break your flow, but where do you find like these um, harder to find sort of ingredients, like the grains, for example? Is, is that yeah. easy to find in, in, in London or UK? or? Yeah, I mean, in London, we're, we're quite lucky. You have a lot of access to a lot of international foods, um, specifically like African food stores or like a right. specialist yeah, food yeah, store yeah. would have something like okay. that you're not really going to find it in your supermarkets or anything like that. So you do need to go to a, like a, a specialist. But because it's London, I think it's quite yeah, easy. Other nice. parts of the UK, it will be quite difficult. Mm, but okay. I'm, gonna, I'm hoping to try and make that easier for people by bringing stuff in from Sudan as well. Oh, and there, are, there are already people that do that as well. It's mm. just that people don't know about it. So there, there might be access to these ingredients, but... 
people just don't know how to get them or where 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 to get them yeah from. and probably yeah. if 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 even people you know go to these specialty stores and they see it they're like oh that's interesting but then they don't know what to what to do with it you know <laughs> yes, exactly yeah, so um and then what about um sort of desserts and sweets like what what do sudanese typically do for those so all sorts of things again because of the difference in cultural influences. Mm-hmm. You do get again a lot of Middle Eastern uh, uh, desserts and, and and North African desserts as well. Something that's commonly eaten is called shaeria, which are like these vermicelli pasta okay. and uh, served with like a sugar syrup. Then, yeah, really good. <laughs> then there's a lot of like really typical Middle Eastern stuff like kunafa, mm, yeah. um, which is like the very very thin angel hair desserts. Um, basta is is exactly the same as baklava. Okay. Uh, but then you get more kind of West African influenced foods like medidas, and they're like a porridge. It's like a very kind of sweet porridge, mm-hmm. and they can made be made from different things, so like dates, or they can be made from millet, or they can be made from sesame even sometimes. Wow. And again, you, you see the difference in the consistency because the some of the West African ones are, as I said, are quite porridgey, right. they're quite uh, eaten out, out of a bowl, whereas some of the, the Middle Eastern ones might have a bit more, um, I don't know, spiced a bit differently or yeah. maybe made from a different type of base. That is so interesting to me, the the sort of West Africa. But I guess when you look at the map of Sudan, like it's, you know, it's not, it's not just north, but it's eastern and then it goes a little bit yeah. down central and almost yeah. west, I suppose. Exactly, exactly. I mean, yeah. let's not get any misconceptions. Sudan definitely isn't in West Africa, but right. because yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the, the connection that it's had yeah. since, uh, since Islam kind of became about, um, there's something called the Sudan Road, which actually went, from West Africa, like Ghana, Nigeria, northern Nigeria in particular, and it cut through Sudan, which is why it was called that, and it led to Mecca on the other side of the Red oh, Sea. Okay. So what that was, it yeah, it brought a lot of West African pilgrims through Sudan uh, on on their way to Mecca to pay uh, to pay pilgrimage. Uh, sometimes a lot of these groups wouldn't even make it to Mecca. But they might have enough to kind of start the journey, but they wouldn't have enough to complete the journey. So a lot of people would actually end up residing in Sudan because they didn't get back. Yeah. Or maybe they did go, but on their way back, they decided to just stay. So And then they would say, okay, so that's when that's, that's where you sort of start, started to get that, um, I guess, West Africa. Yeah, influence, exactly. Right. Yeah. And then the last thing I wanted to, to ask you about in terms of Sudanese food specifically, because I, I saw this somewhere the other day, because I had this interview in my mind, was uh, some, uh, I think I read or someone mentioned a drink called and I might pronounce this wrong, like kakade or kakade? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Made with hibiscus flowers. Is that's that right. correct? Okay, that's which it. is which to me was like mind blown because that is such like a common thing in, in West I mean I, people call it different things across sort of yeah. the West African that's coast, right. but but that yeah. that's the common sort of denominator and that the strength is made with hibiscus flowers and depending on where you go it's made with other spices and it kind of absolutely, spicy and less absolutely. spicy. It's so how is that. how is that how is it made in Sudan? It's, yeah, it's very standard to be honest with you, very and very simple as well. Not a lot of spices go into it. It's just the hibiscus flowers themselves, the dried ones. They're soaked in water to get the, the tea out, the cold infusion, and then they're just sweetened with sugar. So quite straightforward. Oh, nice. But we're we're lucky in Sudan that we also have the white variety as well, which I've rarely oh. seen elsewhere. So there's there's white kerkede, uh, which is made from the white hibiscus yeah. flower. And it has a slightly different taste. There's still mm-hmm. that kind of bitterness. But, yeah, um, I'm it's just, ready to it's try special. Sudanese food. <laughs> Say this, that again? This all sounds so good. I'm just ready to dive. I've never had Sudanese food, so... Oh, you'll love it, honestly. Yeah, I'm, that's, that's interesting. That's almost like a, I mean, white sangria and a, a red sangria, almost, if you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, hibiscus is not just African either. I, I've right. seen it in, yeah. in Mexico as well, mm-hmm. obviously. Jamaica. But yeah, that's it's just one of those interesting sort of again connecting threads, if you will. Exactly, and that's what I'm people. interested in is like tracing the the roots of these foods, uh, why they've made their way to other parts of uh, the country or the continent or even the world. 
So I like making those connections. Yeah. So it's interesting. That's great. And then um, let's talk about then the food scene in, in, in the UK as it pertains to Sudanese food. Like, What's sure. in a sort of your experience? I know because when you were in, in Manchester, that probably wasn't <laughs> the best representation, of course, probably not as diverse, but in, in London, per se, do you think that there's enough representation and sort of what have you done in terms of events, supper clubs, either there or, you know, around the world to sort of start to introduce people to the variety within the Sudanese cuisine? Yeah, sure. Well, to be honest with you, things have changed quite a lot, actually, since I even started this project, like um, three, four years ago, something like that. So, yes, at the time in Manchester, there wasn't a Sudanese restaurant. But at the time, uh, sorry, now, there, there is actually a lot more um, Sudanese foods available. Uh, and it's the same for London, too. Um, so in London, there was a very well-known Sudanese restaurant um, that closed down about five years ago. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, and now there isn't a Sydney's restaurant in London, which is quite unbelievable, really, considering yeah. it's like such an international city. Yeah, of course, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other restaurants in the UK. There are others in Brighton, mm-hmm. I believe there's one in Leeds as well, and I, th- I, I think like in Manchester too. So, um, yeah, there are, there are other restaurants around, but the scene is very small. Okay. Um, and some of them, are, at least the ones in London, they're more like uh, small kiosks. So there is okay. as- access to Sydney's yeah. food, but they're in kind of small kiosks in the market. I wouldn't say they're restaurants, right. you know what I mean? Okay. There's definitely um, some traction there. And I think more and more people are, uh, are yeah, having, so, having access to yeah, this food. Yeah, so then in terms of how you add to that space, in terms of events, supper clubs, etc., like what, what are some of the events you've hosted? And what yeah. has that experience been like? Oh, it's been really great. So it's, it's mainly because there isn't that much access to Sydney's food that I, I decided to kind of make these kind of supper clubs and pop up uh, just as a way for people to, to try the food, to have access to it. And I post about it and they come and they buy the tickets and, and we sell out very quickly. And it's a really fun experience to do. And I work with my friends and, it's, they're always very fun experiences. I really, really enjoy uh, enjoy hosting them a lot. Um, and then as I think about that and then compare it to sort of, because I'm most familiar with West African food, so compare mm-hmm. it to sort of what people are doing in that space also um, mm-hmm. in, in the UK, because I know quite a number of people doing that in the UK. I find that they tend to sort of... Um, they tend to struggle, I shouldn't say struggle, but one of the challenges that is faced is sort of maintaining the authenticity of what you're trying to present to your audience while at the same okay. time trying to make it accessible, right? So yeah. to, so to yeah. your Western, uh, quote unquote, a Western <laughs> audience, right? Exactly. So in as much as, you, you know, you want to, to sort of bring your, your home, co- you know, your home cooked food not even home cooked food but like food from home to yeah, a wider yeah. audience you're also sensitive to sort of the palate of in in, yeah. in the in sort of the place where you're at so how do you address that or do you not find that to be as much of a um, no a that that is a challenge i think it's definitely going to be a challenge when you do want to kind of share um uh whether it's African foods or Sudanese foods or anything to someone that's not used to that food right. for the first time. So yes, that is a challenge. So what I try to do is be very selective with the things that I'm introducing them to. I'm very aware that these people have never eaten Sudanese food mm-hmm. before and they know nothing about it. So I wouldn't want to make them something that they're a little bit more adventurous, for example. <laughs> yeah. I would kind of take it easy on them for the first uh, for the yeah. first few times. Um, <laughs> Typically, Sudanese foods are sometimes eaten with, with your hands. Yeah. So when I've done these events, I, I always kind of understand that maybe people aren't going to be that comfortable right. to do that. So I kind of slowly, you know, take people on small little steps and, and, and try and kind of test them at the same time right. as well. Allow them to, if they're willing to be more adventurous, to, to, to be, you know, to be more involved in the yeah. way we eat the foods. And so, that, I find that to be interesting, uh, because I remember um, I was in in Dubai one time and I went on this food tour, like a, it was super authentic food tour where you go into like the Emirati local neighborhoods and try like proper Emirati food. Okay. And uh, sort of the culmination of the tour was like a real Emirati dinner, family dinner where you sat on the floor and it was family style dining and we all had to eat with our hands. 
Right. And I remember, like, to me, it's just such a natural. It's not, I do without a second thought. But it was mm-hmm. such an experience for most of the rest of the group Absolutely. that it just did not even. And it's so interesting how things that, you know, come almost second nature to us, like, it's, exactly. it's interesting to, to how other people view that, right? And yeah. so, yeah. And, and it's good that you think you even thought about that, because I it would not have crossed my mind as something <laughs> that would have been, <laughs> you know, a thing, right? Because it was just, yeah. to me, it's just, you know, exactly. it, it is what we do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, we so... Just- yeah. So I just ask people to, you know, take the, the path that they're comfortable to take, but you know, give them give them an experience at the same time yeah, as well. Right, definitely. Cool. So um, I think that we can switch gears now. Uh, let's talk about your cookbook project. So you're working on a project, um, mm-hmm. hoping working towards a cookbook. Could you speak a little bit about that and sort of what you're hoping to accomplish with with that? Yeah. So I guess I just really want. Um, these recipes documented. I, I want kind of the documentation of these recipes to, to hopefully last for a long time. And, um, you know, these recipes aren't written down anyway. You know, you'll, you'll see some things online, right. uh, Sudanese recipe, this or that or whatever. But I really want a proper cookbook um, for Sudanese food. And what's interesting is this has never been done before. So there's never been, well, there, there's never been an English language Sudanese oh, cookbook published. Okay. So I'm hoping uh, to to make the, the first one. It would be a pleasure and an honor to, uh, to to have that achievement. And, yeah, I just really want uh, people all over the world to have access to this food because it's their right, uh, equally as much their right mm-hmm. as it is to these people's, to have access to Sudanese food. And I want Sudan also to be painted objectively in this, in this book as well. I don't want people to kind of have this international opinion of Sudan and let that kind of be the the end of the story. I want right. people to broaden their horizon on the country a little bit, uh, and I want to be. Yeah, so, want how, to be quite, what what quite stage good. what stage of the cookbook are you at, and sort of what what do you sort of need help or support with? So that if if there's someone that's listening, that's you know in publishing or PR or whatever, that would like to help. Um, well, and just around. The, thank you for that. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm literally just about to have the book sponsored, hopefully. Oh, awesome. Which is fantastic. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time coming. Um, so we're just around the corner, I think, from, from signing on the dotted line. Um, but I think I would like people from whoever's listening, if anyone knows, maybe potentially any distributors, because I am i won't actually be signing with um, with a publisher. I think we're going to have to go down the independent road okay. with, this, with this one. I've tried to go down the publishing route, but it hasn't always it hasn't worked out okay. uh, for for you know uh, various reasons. Um, but if anyone is listening who can maybe help distribute the book um, in North America, in Europe, and elsewhere, in Dubai or whoever, um, do f- feel free to get in touch uh, through the website uh, or the social media accounts. So okay. it's- Perfect. That's a perfect segue to, to tell people where they can find you online. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. I, didn't, I wasn't sure if yeah. I should plug that. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. So, thanks. So the website is SudaneseKitchen.com. And there's the Instagram, which is at Sudanese Kitchen. The Facebook and the Twitter and the YouTube are all the Sudanese Kitchen. So it should be quite easy to find. But all the links are on the website, which is just... Yeah, and then we will, put, we will put that also in the in the podcast show notes sure. so that people sure. can reference that. Um, no, this has been uh, this has been great, Omer. I've learned so much about Sudanese food and even my own sort of, uh, I guess, our West African connection to, to yeah, Sudan. Definitely. Which, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I didn't, long, long <laughs> which I didn't know about. Um, so the last segment here we're going to do is the rapid fire. So I'll just ask you... Question, the first sort of instinct answer that comes to the top of your mind. Super easy, super fun, um, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Sure, sure. Okay. So first question is coffee or tea? Tea. Dine in or take out? Dine in. Morning person or night person? Night person. I think I know the answer to this question already. Instagram or Twitter? Because you see... <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> You mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, sweet or salty? Sweet. Uh, what's your biggest pet peeve? Um, 
I don't, I don't know, not really anything that much. Oh, good, good, okay. <laughs> Your favourite TV show right now? Favourite TV show? Yeah. Uh, I'm watching something called The Deuce. Um, okay. Which is about, yeah, which is about New York, New York City. Oh, nice. I don't think I've mm-hmm. heard of it. I should go look that up. Um, mm. And then, when you're feeling lazy, what do you cook? When I'm feeling lazy? Yeah. Um, something easy. Probably food, because it's so easy to make. <laughs> food is not like cooking. <laughs> No, full. Um, oh, full. Okay, okay. The, okay. the, the bean, the, the fava beans that you mentioned? Muscle. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then if you could complete the sentence, this next year, I'm going to try to eat more... Fish. Oh, actually, we didn't speak about that. Do you guys eat a lot of fish in your cuisine also? Yeah, yeah, because Sudan's got the Nile. Right. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. So yeah, there's good. a lot of fish. But there's a lot of meat generally, but at the same time, I, I don't want people to rely too much on kind of meat. I right. kind of want people healthy alternatives at the same time as well. But yeah, Sudan's known for a lot of meat eating. Okay, cool. And that's it. Thank you so mm-hmm. much for the time. It's been such a pleasure. I've learned so much. Thank and you. I hope uh, this was helpful to you. We'll put this out there shortly. And um, yeah, I hope people get the cookbook when it comes out, follow you online and continue to share in the story of, of Sudanese food that you're trying to get to the world. So. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Item 13, an Essence 13 production. If you like the show, please subscribe, rate and review us on iTunes. To keep up to date on news and events from Essence 13, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Essence and the number 13. Thank you.